thank you, Ralph. And um, I am the next speaker, and that was a nice uh, prelude to what I'm going to talk about. Um, and I wanted to actually preemptively thank the same uh, investigators, especially the folks in my lab, uh, Yoon and, and Lee, technicians in the lab who are here today for um, much of the work that I'm going to speak about. Um, so uh, I know that I also am the one person standing between you and lunch. So I'm going to try to go uh, clearly and smoothly forward in my allotted time. Um, there's no question that glioblastoma has been lacking uh, in novel therapeutics compared to other cancers such as lung cancer. Um, we've only had a couple of approved drugs in the last 20 years or so. Um, but as you've heard this morning, there are a lot of exciting um, new ways of thinking about treating glioblastoma. And I, in particular, believe that um, creative thinking outside the box uh, and using this, these uh, technologies to elicit an immune response to the tumors is going to be a, um, a very potent and robust way to treat these malignancies. The problems we have with treating glioblastomas, uh, just to be very simple-minded about it, are that there are not enough tumor-associated antigens. And you heard um, Dr. Bender this morning talk about uh, EGFR-V3 and um, IL-13 receptor. Those are two known ones, but there aren't too many other ones. And the tumor has a mic uh, microenvironment that's extremely um, immuno, immuno uh, inhibitory. Um, I always like to show this uh, slide because um, we do have uh, immunotherapies now that, oops, that work very well for tumors such as uh, melanoma and some lung cancers because there's so many mutations. And this is a this is from a paper in Nature where they showed the average mutational burden of melanoma is about a hundred uh, mutations per million DNA bases. Whereas in uh, most other tumors that don't respond to just these checkpoint inhibitor drugs, uh, they have a lower mutational burden. And with a lower mutational burden, you don't have as many um, neoantigens. So what does that mean? I'm, I'm trying to sort of explain the key concepts here. So if you have cigarette smoking, asbestos, or something like UV, and the DNA is, nas is, is being mutated all the time, then these changes in base pairs will lead to changes in the RNA sequence. Change, enough changes in the RNA sequence will lead to changes in the amino acid sequence. Novel proteins will then be produced in the tumor that were not there when your immune system de developed. And your body will say that these are not quote unquote self antigens. These antigens will be taken up by dendritic cells processed and these dendritic cells will go to your lymph nodes and tell your T cells that there's something out there that wasn't there or wasn't supposed to be there. And these T cells can then mount an immune response to these quote unquote neo antigens or tumor associated antigens. And usually the tumor grows uh, immune to this response unless you block the inhibitory things on T cells, allow those T cells to become hyperactive and then they will all of a sudden wake up and see that these neo antigens are not supposed to be there. And that's the basis of the checkpoint inhibitor breakthrough with PD-1 and CTLA-4 inhibitors that has revolutionized treatment of melanoma and some other cancers like lung cancer. But glioblastoma cells don't have all those antigens on them. And they also have a lot of white blood cells in there that actually promote the cancer. They come in there and they promote expression of cytokines that are very immunosuppressive. And the T cells that come in, if they get in at all, are being blocked by these same inhibitory molecules that I just mentioned, PDL1, uh, things that make the T cells shut down, PD, PD1 and CTLA4. So you basically have a force field around the tumor preventing the immune system from coming in. So our lab, in our lab, and what I've been trying to do in the last few years is think of big picture, what are ways we can uh, address these two major problems. There are too few tumor-associated antigens, so if we could discover novel tumor-associated antigens, that would be critical. There's also an immunosuppressive microenvironment, 
is there a way we can somehow turn the microenvironment of the tumor from immunosuppressive to active immune uh, in, inflammatory, for instance? Um, uh, you heard earlier today that um, Dr. Sean Lawler mentioned the role of cytomegalovirus that we, we still don't understand, but it does seem that the uh, work that my group did years ago has led to more and more in interest and in the possibility that cytomegalovirus antigens, which should not be in the tumor, are present. And I just, um, this is a paper that was published a few years ago by a group in Norway where they showed, yes, indeed, they could find multiple CMV antigens in human glioblastomas. And there were actually T cells specific to those antigens in the glioblastoma. But when they looked at those T cells, they had high levels of expression of CTLA-4 and PD-1 inhibitors. So the immune system cells that did get into the tumors were completely non-functional. So they were not killing the virus, they were not killing the tumor cells, they were sitting there doing nothing. Um, nevertheless, this is a unique opportunity to leverage these uh, unusual antigens to make an antiviral response. And indeed, as uh, Dr. Lawler mentioned, my colleagues at Duke University and a couple of other biotech companies are vaccinating patients now against cytomegalovirus, um, one of the antigens called PP65. And at least in the preliminary studies, the survival data are staggeringly positive in terms of median survival out four or five years for these patients. And that's been repeated in two or three studies done by the Duke group. And now it's in a larger phase two study, which would be very exciting if just vaccinating against one CMV antigen can elicit a big immune response to glioblastoma. And even more exciting to me is uh, people have taken this concept to tumors that don't have any evidence of cytomegalovirus. And they've said, what if, what if we could actually put CMV antigens in these tumors um, in an animal model where the mouse has been exposed previously to CMV. As Dr. Lawler said, most humans have been exposed to CMV. What if you could actually vaccinate the tumor with CMV? So this investigator, who's a very famous guy at the National Cancer Institute, just published a paper last summer where his group showed that if they, in, if they injected peptides or proteins of mouse CMV into tumors in mice, in the, in the presence of something called poly-IC, and I'm gonna discuss that in a minute, that they could cause a massive immune response, memory response by the, the, the mouse who has previously seen CMV to come into the tumor, gobble up tumor cells and in the setting of a, 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 what the immune system detects is a, a CMV infection of the tumor. Very interesting, and all the mice that got this, the, the appropriate antigen uh, put into their tumor plus this poly-IC, uh, their tumors went away and they couldn't grow tumors later in the same mouse when they injected them because the immune system had established a memory. Very fascinating work. So briefly, I wanna mention what poly-IC is and then talk about it again a little later. Poly-IC is a molecule that your immune system thinks is double-stranded RNA. It's a synthetic molecule. But why is that important? Your body is not supposed to have double-stranded RNA in it, but viruses, when they infect you, create double-stranded RNA. That triggers probably an evolutionarily conserved, millions-old immune response that activates something called toll-like receptor 3. This basically is like the fire alarm going off in your cell and your cell believes that it's having a viral infection and it creates a huge immune response uh, with activation of multiple pathways and inflammatory cytokines. And if this happens in a, a, a white blood cell, for instance, it'll produce cytokines. But if it happens in a tumor cell, for instance, if you activate, activate these toll-like receptors, especially number three, it will create a rapid influx of immune cells NK cells, antigen-presenting cells, cytotoxic T cells that will overcome that immune resistance. So basically, it's a way to cause the tumor microenvironment to look like, you know, there's a fire going on and the immune system is the uh, fire department coming in to gobble up the tumor. That would be wonderful if we could get that to happen in glioblastoma. I'm going to take a slight side uh, um, talk for a second. One of the very very bright postdocs we had in the lab, uh, Dr. Karimi, 
wanted to figure out how we can find new antigens in glioblastoma. I mentioned cytomegalovirus antigens, and he came up with a very interesting concept that had just has just started circulating, um, and it in involves alternative splicing. So I'll remind you that your DNA encodes for RNA, and RNA is made up of exons and introns, and the, the protein is made by patching together like beads on a string the appropriate chunks of the RNA that encode for what is actually turned into the protein. When you're developing, you have some things that happen that are not seen later in your life. And so it may be that this protein is always produced in the adult, um, but we know that in certain ca in cancers, sometimes alternative splicing occurs. So a protein could be spliced differently and this C segment could be inserted. If that happens, then you now have a protein with a new chunk of protein in it that's not normally there and your body has not seen that before or maybe hasn't seen it since you were in development. So using that concept, we came up with the idea that if these new proteins are being created specifically in glioblastoma cells, perhaps we could look through our biobank of tumors to see uh, are there these proteins actually being, being expressed alternatively, splice proteins in the glioblastomas? And what if we could find that there were 20, 50, something like that, uh, unique protein chunks that were being expressed in glioblastomas? And then we could uh, partic potentially f say that these are novel non-self antigens that we could target with a vaccine. So the strategy that we've uh, put together, and we've gotten preliminary data that has been funded uh, recently by the National Cancer Institute, is to go through looking at RNA sequences of glioblastomas, and that those databases are out there, and find you know predicted alternatively spliced proteins. And then when I operate on patients, we take sometimes normal brain on the way down to the tumor, and we take that, set it aside, and then take the tumor tissue and uh, Yoon comes down to the lab and gets that. And then we grind it up and we run it on a gel. And then we do, um, we do mass spectrometry. And we, we chop it up into little peptides. And then we run the normal and the tumor. And we look to see if those predicted new pieces of protein are actually in the tumor. Um, and we have plans to determine later on if those will alter the tumor biology. But the most important uh, aspect in terms of immunotherapy is can we find a bunch of these proteins that are expressed in tumors that are not expressed in normal brain? And this is an example of a gel that was run in the lab with the normal here and the tumor here. And we cut it out all these little segments and then we do mass spec of segments. And we had a brilliant uh, student named George Sun who's at Yale Medical School now who was in the lab and he wrote a software program that would run all the tumor and normal side by side and you could see which proteins were present. And what we have in this preliminary data is three tumors with the matching three normals from those patients. And when you break these down into little chunks of protein and run them through mass spectrometry, you'll find that a lot of the times you see about the same, these three and these three, these three, these three, not, not much difference. But occasionally you would see only in the tumor, this protein and these three normals are negative, and only in this, this protein and these three are negative. And so what we now have is a software that can detect unique proteins expressed in the tumors. And we followed that up by doing some other staining techniques where we'll go back and stain the tumors and see that these proteins like this one, HMOX1, is not expressed in normal, but it's highly expressed in tumor. And in this case, this protein, MSI2, which is known to be an important cancer-associated protein, um, gets spliced differently in tumors. If you run a gel and look for this protein on a Western blot, the normal band is usually here. And all these are tumors, and you can see none of them have the normal band, and they all have a higher band here. And that, in, that suggests that there's an intra, a, a piece of protein spliced into that and that may be a target for an immune response. So that's what we are trying to do in terms of uh, creating targets for novel proteins in these tumors. So sort of big picture, if you look at this schematic, let's say you normally have a protein that is this little red guy and it gets chopped up 
put on the immune, put, you know, chopped up and presented, and your and your immune cells think it's a normal, you know, self protein. But if you have an alternatively spliced one, uh, shown here in blue, if you could, uh, if it's also getting presented to T cells and it's considered a new antigen, then you could actually develop a vaccine or CAR T cell therapy. Uh, vaccinate with that blue protein and perhaps mount an immune response to the tumors. And so what we're hoping to do is do a, a lot of, uh, look at a lot of tumors to see if we can find commonalities of specific unique proteins and maybe come up with a panel of different uh, targets that we could make a vaccine panel to and do a combination therapy similar to what Dr. Bender was saying about targeting two things at once, but maybe we could target 10 things at once. Um, so I mentioned that the first problem uh, for immunotherapy is finding neoantigens or novel antigens. And we talked about a viral antigen, which should not be in the tumor. And we talked about possible new alternative splice antigens. And now I want to get back to that toll-like receptor 3 uh, that I mentioned before. Um, how can we stimulate the microenvironment? Uh, I was working... Um, are with Dr. Heath and his group at Institute for Systems Biology. Uh, and this project actually uh, didn't go forward because of funding issues, but his group ha had been carefully looking at glioblastomas, tumors taken out, of, taken out of patients after they had been treated with a PD-1 checkpoint inhibitor. And he was trying to figure out why the T cells are not in there. So what we're looking at is a glioblastoma and the tumor cells are green and the T cells are red. And you see that there are just very few T cells in this tumor. If you look, for instance, at a melanoma that was treated with a checkpoint inhibitor, it's mostly red cells gobbling up the tumor cells. So he took these little areas and he looked at the uh, microenvironment around them and what proteins were being expressed. And um, you know, it's nobody's surprise that a lot of the proteins that were highly expressed in the area uh, where the tumors did not have T cells were those that were known inhibitors of immune function like IDO, B7H3, and VISTA. Um, so the, th the fact that that investigator at the National Cancer Institute showed that this molecule poly-IC can dramatically increase the immune effect of the CMV vaccine led us to um, talk with a local biotech company about possibly developing a way to get something into the tumors that would activate that pathway. And there is a company in town who I'm um, uh, you know, in discussions with that actually has something that actually can express this molecule in the tumor microenvironment consistently. So it kind of, uh, it kind of cuts ahead of this part, which has been difficult to do in humans, and goes right to the meat of the problem by activating toll-like receptor 3 pathway. So the concept would be, can we activate the toll-like receptor 3 pathway, which will activate all the infl inflammatory cytokines in the tumor and cause a massive influx of T cells and um, immune cells to fight the tumor in the setting of a, a simultaneous vaccine to CMV or potentially down the road to one of these spliced proteins. Um, and so this is where uh, we're hoping to go in the next year or two with our lab group uh, to start investigating this using the SPLICE system. Um, and this is my last slide. Um, but you saw this slide already. Ralph Pachowski just presented that um, the work uh, that he did used uh, a slice of tumor out of the patient where we slice the tumor up and we put it in these little chambers and we use the patient's white blood cells in those chambers so what we're hoping to do is use this as a model system, add the toll-like receptor 3 uh, molecule to activate an immune response, see if we can go, get those immune cells to get really fired up in that setting, and then see if they will attack some of these novel antigens that we can put into this slice culture, um, just like he used the um, oncolytic herpes virus in the same way, and then get the readout of you know, what's going on in terms of the T cells and the, and the in, inflammatory cytokines and the immune response in these, uh, in these chambers. You know, the ultimate goal is that if we want to cure glioblastoma with immunotherapy, we're going to have to do something to overcome this force field that prevents T cells from getting into the tumors. We're going to have to have new 
uh, molecules in the tumors that the T cells or NK cells can attack and kill. So um, we're trying to simultaneously take on both of those uh, concepts at, 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 in the Ivy Center lab. Um, and the, sort of the conclusion of that slice culture uh, paper that um, Dr. Pachowski just discussed was that the size of the recruited CD8 pool, T pool and the antigen specificity are most important factors in terms of an immune response to the tumor. Um, and the really good thing about the CMV uh, concept, if it works, is that if you've been exposed to CMV as you get older, CMV is chronically being produced in your system and up to 10, and in some people, even 30 or 40% of all the T cells in their whole body are just specific to cytomegalovirus. So that suggests if you can activate, if you can trigger that immune response, you'll have a huge recruitment of T cells potentially that are they're already readily available to come in and attack the tumor. So all we need to do is tr get that environment right to activate that immune response. So in summary, glioblastoma immunotherapy, uh, there's some major impediments, which is lack of specific tumor associated antigens and the immunosuppressive tumor microenvironment. The success will require a large influx of cytotoxic T cells and antigens to make them attack the tumor and kill the tumor cells. Some uh, antigens that we're looking at are the cytomegalovirus proteins and these possible antigens that we're hoping to discover in the um, uh, research work that we just got funded from the NCI. And our hypothesis is that if we can identify these antigens and then express toll-like receptor three or other things that can induce this ro robust immune response um, then we may have a, a sort of dual mechanism of targeting and treating these tumors in the future. So thank you guys so much. Uh, and right now, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Um, I know we are now about uh, 25 minutes behind, but that's not unusual. But it's lunchtime unless there are any questions. All right, thank you.